Uh, well, I don't know if I'm going to. I try to finish if a little bit early because we have the Lord's Supper today, but I don't know if that's going to happen today, but we'll see. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll skip over into chapter 2 also today. But Paul has assured the Corinthians, as we looked at last time, that he has integrity. His integrity is intact, and that the words he says to them when he says he's going to do something is a trustworthy word. It's, it's true. And because the gospel he preaches is trustworthy, and God is faithful. He's claiming that he's faithful too. He's not flippy. He's not wishy-washy. He's there to tell them what he's going to do, and he's gonna, he intends to do what he says he's going to do. And because the gospel that he preaches is trustworthy, they can glorify God. And it's all God's work anyway in us to make us strong. God establishes us. God works in us so that we will will and do according to his pleasure in our lives. And he assures us of this, that we will be strong because he has given us the Holy Spirit into our lives to guarantee, call it a deposit, a, 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 an engagement ring. He's promised that he's going to fulfill what he's promised to do and he's going to fulfill that by giving us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that our final salvation will happen. So that's what we looked at last time. So I want to just continue with that and uh, read verse uh, 23 through chapter 2, verse 4. Paul says, I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that, it, that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made it my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I've grieved? I wrote as I did that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, <clears throat> but to let you know the depth of my love for you. All right, we're still in a mode where Paul is explaining to the Corinthians his decisions because there are critics who are judging him, critics who are accusing him of being flaky about his plans to visit them, and then the plans get changed. So this is still part of that explanation. He's explaining what's going on with him to his critics, the people who are uh, fussing at him and judging him and coming down hard on him. He's explaining all this, and this time he makes it really strong and really forceful. He says, I call God as my witness, that, as, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. And here he emphasizes, I, use the Greek pronoun. You don't have to do that with Greek verbs. You just give the verb, and it gives the meaning of the subject in it. This time he adds the pronoun, ego, I. I'm stressing to them that I'm telling you the truth. Just like in verse 18 where he said, as surely as God is faithful, here he's doing the same thing calling God as his witness, but it's more forceful than it was as just saying, as surely as God is faithful, we're faithful too. Because what he's about to say here by calling God as his witness, he's serious. Uh, one translator said, I call God as a witness against me if I fail to tell the truth. That's what he means. If I'm lying to you, if I'm not telling you the truth, I call God as a witness. Now, people perjure themselves all the time by swearing on the Bible, I swear to God, uh, what I'm telling you is the truth, and then they're lying to you the whole time. It happens all the time. But you wouldn't do that if you were Paul and you know that God hears you, he sees you, he knows. You're asking God to judge you and punish you if you're being dishonest. I don't want to swear by God if I know I'm about to tell a lie. I swear it's the truth and then lie to you. You really don't believe God's going to do something about that? That's what Paul knows. He knows God's going to do something. God is not going to let you get away with lying, especially if he knows that you're lying about his business, gospel business. That's what Paul's talking about. We're talking about the gospel here. I didn't get to come to you a second time like I, or a third time like I planned. He knows that God can take him out. Now, he wasn't there when it happened, but I'm sure he knows the stories because he hangs out with Luke, and Luke wrote all this stuff down. Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Spirit, and God killed them right there in front of everybody. 
I know he knows that story. So you don't just say, I call God as my witness, unless what you're about to say is the truth. Not if you're Paul, you don't. So he's telling them the truth, and the truth is that he did not make another visit to Corinth again as he planned to. The reason why he didn't go to Corinth again because it would have been a really ugly visit. It would not have been fun. It would not have been pleasant. It would have been a bad day for everybody involved. An ugly episode in gospel ministry with Paul. He says, I, I didn't come to you so I could spare you. The word there means to avoid, to refrain, to keep oneself from doing something. I didn't come because my purpose was to avoid hurting you. I wanted to spare you. He knew he had some discipline to do with the Corinthians. There was sin in the church. Something bad had happened. I don't know what it was, but something bad happened in the church, and he had to go there to correct it. And if he went there to correct it, it was going to hurt them. It would have been hard on them. The rebuke that he was going to make to them would have perhaps have been too severe and too difficult for them to take. Remember he wrote back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, uh, what do you prefer? Verse 21, shall I come to you with a whip or in love with a gentle spirit? Now, I think Paul was probably concerned because he was really vexed out and really stressed out about the Corinthians that if he went there in person, there would have been some collateral damage and the church would have been hurt. Sometimes you got to tell people things they don't want to hear. Sometimes you got to uh, correct people who need correcting. You've got to rebuke people for sin. There are things like that that happen, but man, it can cause damage. It can hurt people. And if you don't have the right attitude or the right heart or the um, just over the top, it can be damaging. I mean, I know people, I know Christians who are so concerned about your sanctification and they feel like it's their responsibility to fix you, and they're eager and willing to rebuke you, and they want to get you on the right track. Y'all know people like that? I have known Christians like that. I don't care whether it hurts. I don't care whether it's going to be helpful to you. They just want to rebuke you. But Paul is reluctant to blast on the Corinthians. At least this time he is. Now, I do know that Paul is stressed out that there's sin in the church. I know that's true. Sin happens in the church, and it just, he cringes. Like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. And that there needs to be discipline in the church and correct the sin in the church. I know that's what's going on in Paul's heart. I truly do know it. But handling it in perhaps maybe an overbearing or a hard way could make things worse. And he did not want to hurt them that's why he didn't go. It was to spare them any damage, any hurt, any harm. And it's obvious that it's per if you went in person, it was going to do that. That's, at least that's what he's thinking. And so his point is, is if I give the Corinthians time to work on this problem and repent and correct their attitude toward me or whatever other sin problem they were having, if I just give them some time to work on it, they'll get it fixed, they'll work on it, there'll be repentance, and I won't have to use a whip. I won't have to come and establish my apostolic authority and demand that you guys straighten up right now, doesn't matter what damage it causes. I don't want to bring a whip. I want to be gentle. I want to have love. I want to treat you like a father because he calls them his children and he, he, is his, he is their spiritual father. But even when you have those kinds of good motives and pure reasons not to harm people, that can be used even, that can even be used as a power grab or manipulation. Look how sweet I am. Don't y'all like how sweet I am? Now get to work like I told you. That kind of stuff. But not with Paul. He is not like that. In verse 24, he says, Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. Paul doesn't have any ill will toward the Corinthians. He does not wish to dominate 
his authority over them. He is the apostle. He does have real authority. He can come and by the authority that Christ gave him, demand that they straighten up. Just be a real bully if he wanted to be. He could be. He doesn't want to be that way. He doesn't want to lord it over them. Lord over means have power over, master them, reign over them. Paul is not the boss of the Corinthians. At least he's not thinking of himself as the boss. I'm not the boss, and I'm not here to impose my will on you. He is not here to micromanage their faith. That's not his motive. His motive is nothing like that. He wants to see the Corinthians exercise their faith and do what's right without him having to be there and manage everything. That the church itself in Corinth would establish itself as strong in faith without him being there, without him having to tell them everything. His real authority as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ does not motivate him to lord it over them. Jesus said, um, in Luke chapter 22, there's a dispute that arose among the disciples. I, I, I wonder what it sounded like. It'd be nice to be the fly on the wall to hear them arguing as to which one of them, which of them was the, considered to be the greatest. Now, here's the 12 disciples arguing, I guess Jesus is outside of ear distance so he can't hear what they're saying or maybe he can't hear what they're saying. Maybe they don't care, but he hears what they're saying. He knows what they're saying. They're arguing about who's the greatest and Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles, same Greek word, lord it over them. And those who exercise authority call over them, call themselves benefactors. Aren't you blessed by me being in charge of every one of you? Lording, lording even their goodness over you. That's where the Gentiles are. Then he says in verse 26, Jesus said, but you are not to be like that. You can't lord your authority. You can't lord your greatness. Whatever it is you are, whichever one of you is the greatest, it doesn't matter. You can't lord it over each other. You can't lord it over other people. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. You have to be a servant. Matthew 23 says to his disciples in verse 8, but you are not to be called rabbi. No, there's really nothing wrong with being called rabbi. It just simply means teacher. But what he means by this is you don't think of yourself as the teacher. Like, who is your teacher? Oh, my teacher is Peter. He's the best. Rabbi. You only have one master and you're all brothers. Teacher to them, rabbi to them and what they're thinking or what Jesus is thinking, you're not to be called rabbi. You're not the boss. You're not the master. You're not the top dog of everybody else in the room. You're not in, in control. You're not in charge. Now, you might really be in charge, but you can't think of yourself like that. Don't let anyone call you rabbi. Peter says to the pastors, the elders, 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Verse 3, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. If you're a spiritual authority, if you have leadership in a church, if you're the pastor or an elder or the apostle of the entire church or one of Jesus' apostles, you cannot lord it over people. You cannot be the boss and demand that they get in line. That's not what he's talking about. You can't do that, and Paul is very careful about that. He's not their master, and he doesn't want them to think that, and he doesn't want anyone else to think that. We're not lording it over you. I didn't come because I wanted to spare you, not to lord even that over you. <clears throat> uh, anybody ever seen like, you can watch them on YouTube. There's videos you can watch of domineering pastors. Anyone ever seen stuff like that? Like it's funny in a way. He's like this guy, well, this guy's crazy. He's lost his mind. All he's doing is yelling and fussing at everybody in the congregation. 
rather than true encouragement, rather than being a good, encouraging pastor or leader or shepherd of the church or apostle, uh, any or instead of being really encouraging, all it does is damage the saints. Paul says, I don't want to damage you. I, I didn't come because I don't want you to be damaged. One of the uh, commentators from the 19th, 19th, no, 1800s, that's the 19th century, said, no man, number of men, society, church, council, presbytery, consistory. Anyone ever heard of a consistory? That's how you know it's old language. Or conclave has dominion over any man's faith. But Paul rather considers himself as a fellow worker, a laborer, along with them. The Greek word is synergos. We get our English word synergy from it. It means to work together. It means to cooperate, association, collaborating together. That's what Paul is saying. I'm not here to lord it over you. I am rather want to work with you and collaborate with, with you for your joy. I want to work with you and collaborate with you and associate with you for our, both of our joys, beneficial joy. His motive is to see the Corinthians have joy. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to fuss sometimes. I'm not saying you don't have to rebuke. I'm not saying you don't have to correct. I'm not saying you don't have to reprimand people for when they're out of line. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm telling you, fussing at people a lot does not produce joy. And Paul knows it. The reason why I didn't come was so I could spare you and I would rather see you have joy. Now, joy is a word that I think is confusing to a lot of us. It's confusing to me. I'll tell you why in a second. When I think of joy, I think of people who are smiling, a bright countenance and a good mood, cheery soul, um, cheery deep within your soul, just cheery disposition. Isn't that what you think of? You see someone with joy? Hey, that guy's got a lot of joy. Why? Because he smiles a lot. He's always in a good mood. He's happy. He's cheerful, joyful. And I'm, I indeed think it is that. That is what it means, or that is part of it. But the Greek word, kara, it's the same root as grace, the word for grace, but it means gladness. It means the emotion of great happiness. If you have joy, it's an emotion that you have of just being very happy. Great pleasure, inner delight, having a deep sense of well-being and contentment, that's joy. The confusion that we have about the meaning of the word joy is we always associate joy with having favorable circumstances or pleasant circumstances. We think if everything's going right in our lives, that's going to produce joy. That's what we think it is. No, it is all of that, and I'm not saying favorable circumstances are not good. They're good. If my family's dysfunctional, uh, I'm having a tough time today, or if I lost my job, I'm having a tough time today being joyful, or if I'm sick and found out that I have a disease, I don't feel as joyful. And that's true. I'm not going to deny that. But the joy Paul's talking about really doesn't have anything to do with circumstances. It has to do with spiritual truth. Joy that Paul's talking about comes from having a true relationship with Christ through faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where joy comes from. And I want to work with you and cooperate with you and associate with you for your joy in the Spirit. Really like this. If Jesus, every one of you, I'm talking to everybody here. If Jesus Christ, by his grace, and I mean abounding, abundant, overwhelming grace, grace that you can't even... Imagine how much it is. You have sin that deserves eternal condemnation, but God in just mercy and grace giving you a favor, giving you a gift of eternal life and salvation, forgiveness of sins. You'll never be condemned. You'll never go to hell. Although you deserve hell, you deserve eternal misery and damnation in a burning hell, but yet God gave you grace and saved you instead. 
It's well with your soul. I promise you it is. Doesn't matter what else happens in your life, your soul is safe with God because he saved you. That's where joy comes from. That's where the joy that Paul's referring to comes from. Not your job, not your health, not your family, not your possessions, not your money, not your friends, not your pleasure. Now, I do like it when all those things are in perfect alignment and everything's great, everybody's good, health is good, job's good, pleasure's happening, money's there. But do you know what your joy is? Jesus Christ saved me. Jesus Christ died to save me. There's joy. That's what I want you to have. It's by the Holy Spirit. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. Now, they didn't have pleasant circumstances, did they? They had severe suffering. You became Im imitators of, of us in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message. And the message was the cross of Jesus Christ, him dying to take away sins. You welcomed that message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Joy is one of those by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit filling your life, you will have joy. You'll have this inner delight. You'll have this emotion that everything is good with you. Great pleasure. But it comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from having a faith in what Jesus did on the cross. That's where your joy comes from. And Paul wants to work with the Corinthians that they would have it. Verse 24, we work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand. By faith, faith in Christ, you believe him. You believe Jesus. It's not just uh, the words. It's not just the facts. It's not just the knowledge that you really believe Jesus Christ. You have faith, and that's how you stand. It's between you and God. It's between you and Jesus Christ. You're the one who called on him. You did it with your mind, with your soul, with your lips. You spoke to him, said, Jesus, save me. Between you and him, not between you and Paul, not between you and me, not between you and any other religious person or anybody else that can lord it over your faith. It's between you and him. And by that faith, you stand. Basically, that's Paul's motivation. He says, like, can we let that be my motivation with you? Can we let it be that just you have joy in the Holy Spirit? that you just are filled with joy and have delight in your soul, which is yours through faith in Christ Jesus, can that, can that not be my motivation? You're saved by faith and you live by faith. And if you save by faith and you live by faith, then I guarantee you, you will have a true taste of what it means to have joy in Christ. Might not be without flaw, living in a fallen world, and all the circumstances do pile up on you, sometimes not good ones, but if you have faith in Jesus Christ and he has saved your soul from eternal condemnation, you have joy. And you will know the eternal life in its fullness, and it doesn't matter what, what, comes out, what else comes up, you have joy. That is joy. And that's what Paul wants them to have. So he says in verse two, or chapter 2, verse 1, I don't know why they put the chapter divisions here. This is very arbitrary. That's not where a chapter division goes. And we'll keep going into chapter two. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. Now he had already revisited them a second time since he left Corinth the first time. He left Corinth. He went back to his home church in Antioch, stayed there for a while, then made another journey through the interior, which is modern-day Turkey, where he ended up in Ephesus, where he stayed for three years. So he's been gone maybe four or five years, 
since he went back to see him the second time, which is what he's talking about here, another painful visit. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 14, now I am ready to visit you for a third time and it will not be a burden to you. So he's already made the second visit. That's the one he's talking about here. And we don't know any of the details. I really don't have any idea what the details are. All I can do is speculate. But it's likely, in fact, I'm certain of this part, there was probably some severe sin problem in the church that Paul had to go deal with. He's been gone for four or five years. He finally hears, oh, no, oh, mercy, these Corinthians are messed up. There's something bad going on there. I've got to go take care of it. Some offender in the church, maybe false doctrine. I do know in chapter 7 he talks about someone did something wrong to someone else. I think he's talking about that same event. No matter what it was, when he went to Corinth the second time, it was not a pleasant visit. It was not a good trip. It was a painful, sad, it was grief. It was unhappy. It was regret. That's what the word means, painful visit. And because it was a painful visit, it's implied that it didn't go well. Paul showed up in Corinth. I mean, there's a knock on the door, and you open the door, and it's Paul. That's like when you're a teenager, and your parents go out of town. You have a wild party. And then they come back in town, didn't tell you they were coming back in town. You didn't know when they were coming. And they, they, they pull in the driveway, and there's cars everywhere, and your house is a wreck. You didn't get to clean it up in town. That kind of thing. Oh, no, that's Paul. And it didn't go well. It wasn't a successful trip. It went bad. And he didn't want to do that again. He didn't want to make another trip like that one. And you've got to be thinking if you're Paul, all right, if I'm in this town, I get persecuted. They beat me. They throw rocks at me. They put me in jail. And then if I come to this church, they got all kind of sin problems, so I'm stressed out with them. And if it's not that and it's not that, then I've got to go there and have some pain, emotional pain, stressed out. My feelings are hurt, sorrowful, disciplined. And sometimes I guess if you're the apostle, persecution, sin problems in the church with the saints, having to go hurt them, and by them being hurt, now I'm hurt. Every, it's just not good. It's not good. It is not a good experience. It is not something you want to do again. So I made up my mind I wouldn't do that again. What are you saying? I made up my mind not to visit you with another painful trip. Now, there really is a good reason besides just not wanting anyone to get hurt. I don't want the saints, I don't want to hurt them, and I don't want to be hurt. But he has another good reason why he didn't go with another time. It says in verse 2, For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad, but you whom I've grieved? Now, I said this a while ago. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he calls them his dear children, the same church. And he says, uh, verse 15, Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. So Paul loves these people and thinks of them as his children. And he doesn't think of them as his children like a father who just always spanking his kids and beating them. He loves them. He doesn't want to be a stern father, but he does want them to repent. He does want them to grow up in Christ to be good saints. It makes him sad when he has to rebuke them. It makes him sad when he has to correct them. It makes him sad when he has to spank them. He longs that they would repent. He longs that they would change. And then by just their actions, it would refresh everybody involved. It would refresh his heart with gladness, that's for sure. But he said, I think he means like, if I come again and make you sad again, if I grieve you again, then who's going to keep me from being sad? You? 
you who are just caused to feel sorrow, how in the world are you guys going to help me not be sad? You're sad. How are you going to help me not be sad? You know what the answer to that is? You can't. If everybody's crying, you don't have enough tissues left to give me some. If you're sad, you have no cheery words. If you're sad, you have no comforting hugs for me. You have nothing to brighten up my spirit. Especially if I'm the one who made you sad. I'm the one who made you sad. Now I'm saying, give me a hug. Y'all can't give me a hug. Y'all are mad at me for making you sad. I can't help you. Y'all can't help me because I hurt you. In fact, you probably won't even, they probably won't want to be around you anymore, much less make you glad. Now, there's a principle I want to try to chase down. I don't know how to do it exactly. I think it's something like this. Um, like the boy that cried wolf, you know, he kept saying, wolf, wolf, and finally there really was a wolf and no one came to help him when the real wolf really came. Type, that type of a thing. If you're the one causing a scene, then no one's going to believe you when you truly need them to believe you. If you're the one who makes the drama in the room, running your mouth and making everyone tired of your presence, then don't be shocked if all of a sudden you're by yourself and no one wants to be around you. Something similar to that, something like that. We have a, in the body of Christ, Christians, people who call on Jesus to save them, people who are united to Christ and put together in the same place call the local church. We have a mutual relationship with each other. I belong to you. You belong to me. We belong to each other. And there are people that you love. And I don't mean just God, just here, here sinners, you go live with those sinners and y'all be a church together. Not that, even though that's part of it. It's, I love you. I love you and I want you around me. I want you to be near me, in my life, around me as much as you can. I really do, I mean that. But the principle is this. You give them joy, you make it so that their lives are have a deep inner delight because you're in their life. You work to see that they're happy. You let that be your effort. You let that be what you work toward. Watch what happens. You watch what happens. You make your life so that everyone else is happy joyful, delighted when you're there, when you're, part of their, when you're part of the sphere of their bubble and you're there with them, you watch what happens. One day you're going to need them to make you happy and they'll be there to do it. And you'll come out of your distress and your anxiety and your problems joyful too because you, were the, you made them joyful, they make you joyful. No, I wouldn't say it's foolproof, especially not with me in the room. It's not foolproof. But I do know if you make, it, if you make people bummed out all the time to see you, then they're not going to be able to help you not be bummed out when you need them. I think that's what Paul's saying here. And this is true even when you have to deal with sin. This is true even when you have to correct somebody and rebuke somebody for the sin of the church, which Paul is having to do with the Corinthians. But his point is, is if I come with a whip and it goes bad again like it did the last time, we're not going to be able to recover from that and we're not going to have any more gladness. We're not going to have any joy anymore. That's not what we want. We do want repentance and correction. We want there to be righteousness in the church but we don't want grief. If we could get it some other way without having to, have to be grieved, maybe. But if, if we all know we're going to get grief and hurt, we'll think of another way to try to fix it. That's what Paul did. He says, that's why I didn't come to you for another visit. I didn't come for you for another visit because all I know what would have happened would be grief and hurt. That's why I didn't come. If you really want to know why I didn't come, that's it. And that's why I wrote another letter instead. He says in verse 3, 
I wrote as I did so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. Now, we don't have this letter. We don't know what happened to this letter. This is a, a missing letter. Remember when I started 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians? I talked about there was, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, and, he, and then chapter 5, he says, now about the things I wrote you about. So 1 Corinthians is really 2 Corinthians, and this letter, 2 Corinthians, is really 4 Corinthians because this third letter that he wrote them, we don't have it anymore. We don't know what happened to it. It's a missing letter. Lost in history. And we don't even know what was in it. We don't know what Paul said. We don't know what he wrote about. We don't know what the problem in Corinth was this time. But I'll bet it was the same things that he needed to say to him that if he had gone there in person, he would have been really harsh, he would have been really upset, and it wouldn't have turned out good. Same things in the letter that he would have said to him in person, but he didn't go visit him in person because that would have been bad. But here it's a letter. While still strong and severe and probably had some harsh words in it, Maybe it was maybe not as heavy-handed as going in person. Maybe it was. I don't know. I really don't know. We don't know what it was. But it likely contained, for the Corinthians, the situation that they're dealing with, and it probably had in that letter some positive, uh, well-meaning, well-thought-out instructions how they could work out the problem they were having without him having to be there so that the problem person, the sinning person, the offending person would get their act together, repent, and then when Paul does finally get there, it'll be a glorious day. It'll be a joyful day. It'll make him rejoice. It'll make him happy. Everybody will be happy. They'll resolve the problem with true repentance, and it'll be great. He, write, he writes uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 when he comes. Verse 12 and 13, so even though I wrote you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted you are to us, and by all this we are encouraged. I don't know what was in the letter, but I know that Paul wrote it so everybody would be encouraged. He wrote it so that everybody would see that they love Paul, he loves them, that everybody would be Everybody would repent and everybody would change and it would be a great day. A lot better than going there with a whip. I mean, sometimes you got to spank. But if you can avoid it and still get the same result, write a letter instead. And if the Corinthians take the instructions that he writes... And he wrote to them, he they take those instructions to heart and change and repent and resolve the problem. It would be great. Which is what they did too. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, which I didn't want to do, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, because, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended and so were not harmed in any way by us. Everyone, the outcome for everyone is good. Everyone's going to be satisfied. And Paul is going to be pleased when he does get to come there. And they, everyone's going to rejoice together and Paul's going to rejoice and they're going to rejoice. It's going to be great. This is exactly what Paul was hoping and expecting to happen by writing a letter. Instead of going there, he wrote a letter. And he says in this letter, 2 Corinthians, which he wrote after that letter, he said, I had confidence, verse 3, in all of you that you would all share my joy. He's persuaded. He's persuaded that this letter would have an effect on them. The letter that he wrote was going to have the proper effect, the the right result's going to happen. Confident, persuaded that everyone, Paul and them together, are going to come out of the other end of it with the same joy. They're going to have joy because there was repentance. 
They're going to have joy together because there was correction of the sin problem in the church. And I know that's true because still 2 Corinthians chapter 7 about godly sorrow and repentance. He says in verse 16, I am glad that I can that I can have complete confidence in you. He had confidence when he wrote the letter. Now that he gets the word back that they repented, I am glad that I am can have complete confidence and persuasion that you guys are going to do what's right. I knew you would do the right thing and all of us are going to share in this gladness together. That's what I knew. And that's all Paul wanted. That's all he wanted. <clears throat> I was trying to apply this to myself. I put it in my notes. If you got my notes there, you can read it. You know, sometimes I'll prepare a sermon and I don't know, I think maybe God put someone in my heart while I was working on the sermon, yeah, so-and-so, they need to hear this. And then they weren't even there that Sunday. And you go, Kh. then the next week they're there. But the sermon wasn't about them, but they're there. And then you even wonder if they're there, were they even listening? And you go, And then sometimes they're there and you know they were listening and you know they took it to heart and you know they applied it because you can see a change in their lives and their life by the way they live because they heard your sermon and they were changed by it. And you go, man, that's great. I, I can't wait to come back next week and preach. But they won't be there next week. There's joy for everyone when that happens. Everyone's experiencing joy when that happens. I know I am. But then Paul gives us his heart, and I'll finish here. I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. I never really heard Paul talk like this before. I wrote you out of great distress, much distress, many, great, large amount, great distress, Distress means to crush, press, squash, squeeze, trouble. Not a mild discomfort, but great difficulty. I wrote you, I had great difficulty happening in my soul. Same word in the, used in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered. I wrote you out of hardship. He says, I wrote you out of anguish of heart. That means to be gripped by severe emotional, emotional stress. Paul, when he wrote this letter, because he didn't want to go visit him again, so he wrote him a letter, even when he was writing the letter, he had a state of mental distress and desperate anxiety. Deep down, heavy emotional pain, emotional anxiety. That's what Paul was feeling when he wrote this letter. And cried a lot too. Many tears. He says this everywhere he goes. He says this a lot in his letters uh, when he went to see the Ephesian elders in Miletus before he went to Jerusalem. In Acts 20, he said, be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. So Paul, writing this letter to the Corinthians, was stressed out in his soul, great distress, great hardship, Inside, his heart was full of mental anguish and anxiety, desperation. This is the apostle. He's really messed up. He needs a psychiatrist. And he's crying all the time. No wonder the letter didn't survive. Probably by the time they got it, it was all messed up for all the tears that fell on it while he was writing it. Paper don't last long when it's wet. He had a broken heart about the Corinthians and their situation because of the sinful things going on in Corinth. It was killing him inside. He cared so much about them, it was killing him inside. These are people who should be strong. These are people who should have spiritual maturity and growth and wisdom and faith. Strong Christians, they should be. It's like you should be. But they weren't. And, but no matter, really doesn't matter. 
I mean, it stressed Paul out, no doubt. But regardless of how weak they were or how flawed they were, Paul loved them. He loved them and he wanted them to know that he loved them. That's why he wrote them. He didn't want to make them sad. He didn't want to hurt them. He didn't want to cause them pain. That's the last thing he wanted. He didn't want to grieve them. He just wanted them to know that he loved them. And I think with Paul's case, you can tell. You know, if you have to come up to someone and say, hey, I want to, uh, y'all have heard me say this before. If you have to come up to someone and say, I need to tell you something in love, then I know you don't love me. If you have to qualify what you're about to slam me with, with I love you, I really don't think you love me. I can tell if you love me. I think you can tell Paul loved him. I have to hurt you. I have to tell you something that's going to make you sad, but you know I love you. I didn't want to write you to grieve you. I wanted to let you know how much I love you, how deep I love you. That's all I have. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will uh, press this word into our hearts today. Let us be the kind of people who love one another. And Lord, even if we have things that we have to say that are not pleasant, let us have a genuine heart of not wanting anyone to be hurt, not wanting to grieve one another because we love them. And let us work for each other's joy. Let us work together so that we'll all be glad, have delight in our souls, in Christ Jesus and with each other. Let that be it. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.